Good afternoon and welcome to today's VetNet Entrepreneurship Track presentation entitled Small Business Bank Loans, a Banking Professional's Informational Presentation. My name is Mike Shenick and I'm the Program Manager for VetNet here at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families located on the campus of Syracuse University. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. During today's presentation, if you're participating live and would like to ask a question, please feel free to speak up or you can type it in the comment box out to the right. This can be opened up by hovering over the left side of your screen and clicking on the chat function. For those of you watching live on YouTube, please type the question underneath this live stream and I will make sure that it is relayed. And finally, as always, you are able to type your question out in the Google Plus event page and I will make sure that is relayed as well. I'd now like to welcome Jonathan Sandgarden, a business banking professional from m and Bank here in Syracuse, New York. Um, I'll turn things over to John where he will give a quick um, introduction of himself and then we'll get into the presentation. So Jonathan, over to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. My name is Jonathan Sandgarten. I work for M&T Bank, a uh, large commercial bank um, headquartered in uh, Buffalo, located in the Northeast. My office is in the Syracuse uh, location. I work with small business owners all day, every day. and. Uh, uh, various stages of uh, business uh, life cycle. So I work with a tremendous amount of people in the startup phase, uh, mature companies, uh, people transitioning out. Um, but today I'm here to talk about uh, small business loans to primarily startups or recently formed companies um, and answer any questions anyone might have. That's my contact information as well as uh, my title here at the bank. Um, but if we go to the next slide, I really like this to be as interactive as possible, and I will certainly talk to you about what a bank's going to look for in the form of uh, when we expect to get a loan package, what we want to see in that, some details around that, and then uh, really dive into the five C's of credit. So when we look to explore into, um, into a new loan, what we're going to look for from an underwriting standpoint. So like I had mentioned before, uh, we work with companies in you know every industry, every life cycle, um, uh, but primarily we're going to look at everything in the, the world of startups today. So when I speak to any of the um, programs or C's of credit, it's all going to be from a perspective of a startup or people looking to get uh, a relatively young company off the ground. You can go ahead and next slide there, Jim. So. I, because I work for m &T, which is a large commercial bank. We represent traditional commercial senior debt. So when we look at any type of lending, we are a historical cash flow lender. What that means is we're going to look at the last two to three years of an existing business and try and determine what the future is going to look like because the past is the thing that is most indicative of what's going to happen in the future. When we have a startup situation, we have no history or a very limited history. So obviously we're not going to be able to base any decisions on what that company has done historically because it hasn't existed. Um, five C's of credit, we're going to go through each of them in, in significantly more detail. So uh, if we hit the next slide, we're going to start off with character. Character, for the most part, when we look at a startup, small business, um, especially if there's only one principal or a few, it's going to boil down to credit score. So the individual that is owning and operating this business is the lifeblood, is the only thing that's going to probably drive this thing going forward. And in a small business uh, startup situation, we have to figure out what the past has looked like for that individual on a personal side since we don't have a uh, much of a credit history on a business side. So what that will boil down to frequently is credit score, how individuals have handled the credit that they've had in their personal life in the form of mortgages, credit cards, student loans, whatever that may be. Uh, if we hit the next slide. Capacity, or in other words, cash flow. At the end of the day, after you've paid everything you need to pay, what is left over? How much money is that bottom line showing? Because when we try and figure out what a company can reasonably afford to pay us back, we're going to look at your cash flow. After you're done paying back 
you know, paying your employees, paying your suppliers, paying for your inventory, your rent, your utilities. At the end of it all, what's there? That is the free cash flow that is available for us to be paid back on our loans. Um, if we go to the next slide, capital. So capital is a very broad term, but what it bakes down to is how is the company uh, financed? Where does the money come from to get this company off the ground? And it's the combination of equity and debt. Equity is the money that an owner is going to put into the business to get it off the ground. So this is personal money that's coming from a savings account, perhaps an IRA, or you're borrowing money from an old 401k that you may have had, um, is, is the equity portion of that. So it's the skin in the game, so to speak. The debt portion of that is, is, this, is everything else. So it's the bank loans you're going to have, um, but because we're a traditional commercial bank and startups are difficult because we don't have a history to base it on, a bank isn't necessarily always the best place or the first place to start if you need money because we're not necessarily the loosest. We're not necessarily the person that is going to dive in and, and take a risk on a business opportunity. So a lot of times people will start their businesses with honestly personal credit cards, home equity loans, mortgages on residences that they currently own, um, loans from friends and family. Those are much more traditional avenues for people to get money to get a business off the ground. So maybe you could get a couple years of track record before you go into a, a, um, a traditional commercial bank setting. So when we look at capital, we want to look at how much cash, how much of your um, net worth and personal wherewithal is getting into the business before you come to us. So we would want people to put their own money into their business to start it up um, well before our money comes in. So we always need owners uh, to put money in to establish some sort of owner's equity. Uh, next slide, Jim. Conditions, really broad, probably not really going to make much of a difference in, um, in small business lending, but general economic macro issues. If you wanted to start a speculative real estate building company in Florida, there's going to be macro issues that are working against you, but in general, not something that uh, is going to be much of a headwind for us in this conversation. Uh, next slide. And fifth C, collateral. So as I mentioned before, cash flow is the most important. We want your business to function and to operate and to run um, so it generates enough cash at the end of the day to pay us back. When a bank lends money, we want to lend you, we want to lend you money. We want to get our money back and a little bit of interest, and that's about it. Um, when we get into a risky situation, which startups are because there's no track record, we would frequently look for some sort of collateral in addition to the business being able to pay us back on its own because it mitigates our risk. It makes us a little bit more comfortable that if the business can't pay us back, if those projections don't come through, if those customers that we really thought would sign on, if they don't, and you can't pay us back, how else are we going to get our money? We need some sort of secondary repayment source. So frequently, that's going to be a personal residence, once again. Any sort of personal assets that a small business owner may have um, accumulated throughout their life. We can also look to mitigate our risk through SBA guarantees, which we're going to get into quite a bit. Um, or if you were looking to use uh, the, the loan uh, or a commercial loan to buy equipment and real estate, then those things would obviously be our collateral as well. Personal guarantees are always going to be a must, so that means that if you uh, get a loan from a bank, you're going to be personally guaranteeing it. So if that business doesn't have the ability to pay us back, we're going to come to you personally and say, you know, Mr. Business Owner, anything that you personally own, we would like you to liquidate or utilize for the purpose of making us whole. Um, but we can talk about that in more depth later. Uh, next slide, Jim. So what do we want to see? What does a bank want to see when you bring, uh, when, you, when you raise your hand and say, I'm looking for 
a small business loan. We're going to want to see a pretty comprehensive, robust, well put together business plan. Last couple of years of tax returns, understanding that the business probably doesn't exist yet, so those are only going to be personal tax returns. Um, we're going to be very interested in what your personal financial statement looks like because, once again, if we're looking at a startup situation and there is not uh, a track record or um, anything that we can base it on uh, repayment wise, we're going to look at your personal wherewithal and your personal net worth to be able to make us comfortable if, um, if we wouldn't otherwise be. And regardless of the situation, whether we have great collateral or we can utilize an SBA guarantee or anything to that extent, we're always going to need at least 10% of that project cost in, in, in equity from the owner. So what that means is if you want to start a, a landscaping business and you want $50,000 for equipment, then we would expect the owner to put 5000 of their own money into the project. So instead of looking for us to finance 100% of it, we would only be comfortable with, at most, 90% um, of that. So we would want the owner to get some portion of their own cash, their own skin in the game, uh, before our money gets into the deal. 10% um, is always the minimum, and depending on the industry and the project, that can certainly go up. Um, because we require those dollars in, which is why I, I had mentioned earlier, a bank isn't necessarily, to get a small business loan, a commercial loan, isn't always the first place to start because not everybody can commit to that. The other thing I want to say is when you put your business plan together, too frequently small business owners start with capital. They start by thinking, I need money, how am I going to get it? I would strongly recommend that you end with capital, meaning really flesh out an idea. Make sure that what you want to do is feasible. There are clients that would uh, sign up for your service or your product. There's a market for it that um, there are reasons why you would be successful and that you can justify those um, before you come to us because too frequently people will say, I need money, not really have a fully processed, fully comprehensive um, business plan, business idea uh, to present to us and it's, it doesn't necessarily work out and it's not really for, for the best. Uh, next slide, Jim. Hey, John, if I could just interject real quick. That's, oh, sure. a, that's, an, that's an excellent point in regards to the feasibility analysis of, of your business. Um, we here at the Institute have a feasibility tool that we will be including as part of the launch of our business resource library, which is on track, uh, looks like, beginning of next week, which would be the, let's see, um, Monday the 9th or 10th. Um, so I'll make sure that I post a link to that when it becomes available out on this presentation um, link. And please feel free to take a look at that. Again, it's about 10 or 12 questions long, but it really does kind of hammer through those types of questions because just uh, just because you may think an idea is, you know, is a great idea and everyone's going to want it, it's not always necessarily the case. I'm sure John's come across that. Um, so you really need to look at your business idea, look at your business in a realistic light, and this tool will help you to do that. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need to trash your idea. You just may need to retool aspects of it to make it a little bit more feasible and realistic, um, not only to attain capital, but also to kind of really grow that customer base. So I'll go back to you, John. Absolutely. No, that's great. That's a great tool. I appreciate that. Um, looking at the next slide, previously I said what we're looking for is a really comprehensive, well put together, thought up business plan. That's very easy for me to say in one sentence, but you know, what the heck does that look like? How do I put it together and what am I looking for in that? That could be a whole other webinar <laughs> because it's, it's pretty comprehensive what we're looking for. But that being said, depending on what you're trying to do, you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. If you want to start a landscaping, snow plowing company, that is a very fine, reasonable, feasible thing, and that is not a complicated um, concept that you have to convey to a bank. But that we, we still need a business plan, though, because we want to make sure that you have gone through the thought process and the due diligence of actually going out, identifying who your potential clients would be, understanding what the um, 
price point in which you would charge them, and at what price point do you need to charge in order to, to make enough money to service the debt that you're looking to borrow. So we do need those um, bits of information completed, and we, and we certainly um, we certainly understand how a snow plowing and landscaping business would work in this example. However, we need to make sure that you have gone through those steps and through the due diligence to really fully understand what it takes to run uh, your business and what it means to be able to service this debt. So it's, it's an exercise, um, almost an educational exercise uh, for the applicant as much as, as it is a comforting um, thing from the bank to, to truly understand what your business is. Um, but kind of boiling down a little bit, so what do we want to see in a business plan? I, I make a couple references at the bottom here uh, as places that you can go for further assistance because um, I, I certainly can't get you know overly comprehensive in just uh, you know just half an hour. But we want to look at you know tell us all about your business. What is it? Why do you want to start it? Who are you? Why do you think that you can make this successful? Who your clients are going to be? You need to do some marketing. You need to understand the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats of your business. You want to do your SWOT analysis. Um, and we would need three years of financial projections. This is huge. This is not just a commercial bank saying we'd like this. This is an SBA requirement that says in order for us to utilize an SBA guarantee, which we're going to talk about a lot in a second, um, we need three years of financial projections. The projections are not necessarily the easiest things to put together if you've never done it. Um, so I would strongly recommend utilizing the small business development centers, which are located all over the country. It's a free service. You can utilize an accounting firm. They're probably going to charge you. You can actually utilize local SBA um, offices. Uh, there's a variety of ways for you to do that, but we need three years of projections so we can get comfortable, we can point at what we think the future is going to look like, again, because we have no track record. Um, and it also is a great exercise in understanding for the applicant to make sure that they fully understand the impact of every aspect, every portion of that small business. Um, let's see here. Next slide, Jim. And John, I just yep. put out, for those of you who are watching live in the comment box, I put out the website where you can find your local SBA or SBDC um, office. But again, if you just go and Google uh, SBDC or SBA um, office locator, that should be able to come up and you can find one in your, uh, in your city or your region. I'll, I'll tell you, the folks at the SBDC here in Syracuse and, uh, and some of the other regions that we work in are absolutely outstanding. They will help you. They will not write your plan, but they will help you put everything into it that a bank wants to see because that is who they're preparing it for. So they'll work with you to get your um, your income projections and your cash flow projections and the, the balance sheet's going to look like, and they're going to put it in the format that we need to see it. So they're invaluable. It's a free service. I implore everyone to take advantage of it. So the SBA is a huge component to lending to startup businesses. So the SBA is a subsidiary that works directly with banks. The SBA does not initiate loans directly to clients. They work with the lender to provide a guarantee on the loan that we extend to people um, to make banks more comfortable in a situation that we otherwise wouldn't be. So if we have someone that's a startup, and again with no track record, we have nothing to base it on, but if we feel that we can get close enough, um, we can get almost there, the SBA guarantee is going to guarantee us that if this loan does go bad, a certain percentage of that is going to get paid back to the bank. So that provides some level of comfort, some level of collateral almost, to the bank so that we can give those dollars out um, to small business owners or people without track records. Um, now, obviously, because this is tailored towards um, towards vets, the Patriot Express loan program is, is a tremendous uh, program that's offered within the SBA that allows banks to get up to an 85% guarantee 
um, to make banks that much more comfortable. For the most part, as a lend or as a borrower, as a small business borrower, um, you don't need to know a tremendous amount of detail about that. You don't need to be an expert on the program, certainly, because hopefully your lender or your banker will be, and they can walk you through those steps. Loans uh, through this Patriot program are up to uh, $500,000. Um, they can finance really any portion of a small business. We would expect to see rates in the five and a half, six percent range. And um, in order to utilize an SBA guarantee, there's an upfront fee that is uh, paid by the borrower and it goes directly to the SBA. So that doesn't go to the bank. Um, that fee is based on the dollar amount of the loan, but it's somewhere between two and three percent of that guaranteed amount. So for example, if you borrowed $100,000 under uh, this program, 85% of that gets guaranteed. So uh, the fee is going to be somewhere between two and $2,500. Um, like we talked about earlier, we're going to look for the business owner to get 10% of the project costs into the deal in the form of equity. SBA fees can be rolled into the closing uh, of that loan. So you don't necessarily have to come up with that out of pocket, um, but just understand that those fees exist. And really, when we look to utilize an SBA guarantee, it is not, uh, it's not the cheapest way to go by any means. Um, and there's a lot of paperwork, and there's some hoops to jump through and things like that. But at the end of the day, it may be the only way that we can get you the money. And it might be slightly more expensive than if we didn't use it, but ultimately, if it's the only avenue we have, then that's what we take advantage of. Also, a point of clarification here, banks approve or decline loans. The SBA does not. And just because the SBA guarantees are available to you does not mean that you're automatically approved. Like I was referring to earlier, we're a commercial bank and we operate in a pretty small box. We're very conservative. If your business doesn't fit in there, maybe we can utilize some sort of SBA guarantee to get us comfortable. But if that's not accompanied by a really strong business plan, strong personal credit, some equity going in on behalf of the owner, we're not going to be able to get comfortable with the deal. We're not going to be able to approve it regardless of, um, of any type of SBA guarantees that might be available. Um, next slide, Jim. So what to expect? Um, you know, once you have the full package together and once we get everything we need, the credit portion of it is pretty quick, pretty easy. So once we have the tax returns and the business plan and we fully understand everything, we have everything answered and um, your personal financial statement and all that, we're going to send it to our underwriting team and they're going to make a decision pretty quick. Honestly, two to five days. So once someone looks at it, there's going to be a quick decision. And that underwriter is going to come back with one of three answers. No, we can't do it. Yes, we can do it as applied for. Or yes, we can do it, but we need all of these other conditions to be met. As a small business owner that is looking to get a startup or a young company off the ground, more likely than not, you would receive an answer of, yes, we can do it, but we need all these conditions met. So what that means is, yeah, we'd be willing to do this loan, but we're going to want an SBA guarantee on it. Or we're going to want to take the person's home as collateral. Or we're going to want to take the cash value of someone's life insurance as collateral. So there'd be other conditions or strings attached to that. When that occurs, we would then work with the borrower to get all of the necessary paperwork and SBA documentation and um, any other things that are needed to get those conditions met. So you don't need to worry about finding, going out and finding SBA applications or anything to that extent. Your banker or lender should be able to walk you through that process, um, uh, anything, once you get that approval. That, once we get started with the SBA part, it could take a week, it could take three weeks, it could take a month. It depends on uh, a lot of factors, and I guess the, uh, the factor it depends on most is how quickly the borrower gets us everything back, because once we get the credit approval and we say, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do it with an SBA guarantee, which is probably the way uh, a small business loan would, would look, we're going to package up all of those things that we need, we're going to send it to the SBA, the SBA is going to review it for eligibility, and then they will approve it or decline it. So there is a secondary approval process that is required. For the most part, what the SBA is looking for 
is not any sort of credit worthiness or is this business going to work, it's merely documentation. They want to make sure that the projections have been done, that the business plan exists, that the uh, if there's collateral and the SBA would like to utilize that, that it is properly being utilized. So the SBA would actually then approve or decline, um, not, uh, not on credit, but on uh, are these ducks in a row? Have all of the documents been completed? Are you eligible from a uh, from a guideline standpoint? When I say that, I mean you can't have been you can't have a felony and uh, receive an SBA guarantee. That includes DWIs. You can't have a um, uh, a government backed loan uh, in the past that went bad. So you can't have had another SBA loan that you defaulted on and try and get a new SBA loan. You can't have student loans that were government uh, insured that have been defaulted on uh, if you want to get an SBA guarantee. So the SBA is going to go through all of those eligibility uh, issues and questions to make sure that before they utilize this guarantee on you, because if they give it to you, they may not be give, able to give it to someone else, they want to make sure that you're a good person, that you are, you're, you're going to do what you say, and that uh, you, you know all of these other forms and documentation has been, um, has been met. The other thing that's going to be the biggest dependent on how much time that SBA process is going to take, not so much the approval or the um, declination from the SBA, is what type of collateral are we using? If you want to buy a building, that takes a long time before we could actually close. If we, want, if we need to put a lien on your home as collateral, that's going to add some time. So if you wanted to buy a building, uh, it may take 90 days. You know, It may take three months from application to actually closing. Just need to be aware of that, um, and again, it depends on the type of loan and, and how you uh, how your specific case goes, and your banker should be able to specifically um, specifically speak to that. And, hey John, we have a yeah. question coming in from Crypto Jones on Google Plus. He says, um, you know, you mentioned uh, the SBA guarantee um, if you've defaulted. His question is. What if you defaulted on the student loan but eventually paid that back? Uh, great question, and I'd, honestly, I'd have to check. Um, for the most part, if you've default, if you've ever defaulted on a, on a government guarantee, they're going to have a hard time extending you future credit, you know, future guarantees, future assistance. Um, that being said, contact your local SBA office or your local uh, lender and ask them that. Make sure that they're aware of that at the beginning of the process because that is an eligibility question that will knock you out right away. Thanks, John. You bet. Uh, I think we're good to go, Jim. You want to next slide? Oh, honestly, okay, so for the last uh, three or four slides here, I've included some lingo, some, uh, some things that we're going to refer to and that we're going to look at in... Um, in the underwriting process, uh, some of the ways that we calculate and get to that cash flow um, cash flow figure, and this wasn't necessarily intended to be reviewed with everybody. Um, more of you know, if this presentation can be you know kind of posted or put out there and uh, reviewed uh, at a later point, then um, you know then we can you can do that. So for the most part, uh, that was the outward portion of this uh, presentation. Um, anyone have any uh, thoughts, questions, concerns? We will uh, open it up for questions. I know John Kittleson just joined us in crypto. Uh, thanks for the first question. Um, you know, John, uh, just to give you, this is for John Kittleson, just to give you a little bit of background. We've gone through um, kind of small business banking loans in terms of the SBA guarantees in terms of what the bank's going to look for in submission in, turn, in terms of kind of your business plan, your financial projections. Um, so if you have any questions in regards to that, um, please feel free to, uh, to let us know. Sorry, I had to make sure my microphone was plugged in. But yes, actually, uh, what's the question I have is uh, when you're talking to a banker, and sorry if you hear crackling, I have a fire next to me, so don't mind that crackling sound. Um, in regards to when you're applying and you're talking to the banker, what do they look for kind of intangibly? Not necessarily, uh, you know, I have this business plan, like check in the boxes, but intangibly, like how should you present yourself or what do they look for? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, a great question. I hate to sound crass, but a lot of it, if we're talking about a loan under a hundred grand, under a couple hundred grand, there is a lot of credit scoring. There's a lot of automated process that are, you know, that we're going to go through. Just because we look at so many deals, um, there's got to be some sort of automated process in place. So, from a presentation standpoint, I would you know, be professional. Um, you know, when you, you know, be competent because you are going to need to pitch this to somebody, but you're probably going to pitch it to a local, uh, local lender, branch manager, business banker, whatever, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and you do certainly want to come across competent, comfortable, knowledgeable about your, your industry and your field. Um, but I, I would say it, as long as you're acting, uh, professional and, uh, and comfortable with whatever you're, you're getting into. Not, I, I can't think of anything that's overly, you know, dramatic. Sh shave and wear a, a clean shirt. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> no, I get it. I understand. Sure. Yeah. So, Jonathan, uh, John Kittleson just finished up at our EBV Purdue program. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Yeah, it was an amazing, like, once-in-a-lifetime thing. Crypto was actually there with me. Oh, okay. very good. Very yeah. good. How's oh. your, uh, what's the latest with your business ideas, John. I know that you've uh, talked oh, about have, a few things. Yeah, I know. I have a, many ideas and stuff, but yeah, just right now I'm helping my dad with his. We're getting a website together right now. I'm actually learning uh, coding so I can do a lot because uh, I have another project I'm doing on the side just with like a car exhaust system. It's a really, really neat idea and Crypto's heard it and he, he thinks it's awesome so other people have heard it. They think it's awesome. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'll be making what would be the most technologically advanced exhaust in the world, most dynamic. I mean, it's there. It's like I've talked to people about it. It's like, yeah, like that's amazing. So we'll see. We'll see. My future is really just, we'll see where I go. Nice. Good. It's always fun to hear your new ideas, John. Thanks. <laughs> I'm full of ideas. That's what Absolutely. people, they, they have the trouble with the idea. I have the trouble with like, I have too many options and too many ideas. I'm like, uh, that motivational speaker was talking about nerd squirrels or whatever. <laughs> it's like you see a, a dog sees a squirrel, it's just like squirrel, like and its attention zoomed off. I have that a lot, problem. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of bright lights in your in your life, huh? John? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, John, Jonathan Sandor, and I, I appreciate you hitting on the uh, the SBA and the SBDC. I um, you know, we here at the institute. Um, a number of our organizational programs, our educational programs, are run in conjunction and in partnership with the SBA, and they're a great, great resource. Um, you know, in addition, obviously, to them, the SBDCs, your local uh, small business incubators, anything like that, you know, to help get your ducks in a line, um, really, really can't help. And it only, you know, speaking not from personal experience, but from experience in dealing with veterans who have gone, um, you know, getting everything in line in a way that the bank looks for, like Jonathan was saying, can only help the process. Again, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it aids the flow of the process. Um, so, John Kittleson, do you have any other questions? Um, let me think. Hmm. What, let's say, what's kind of the minimum credit score people should shoot for? Like, if they wanted to be approved, like, I'm sure it changes with the market and everything, but, you no, know, what a, do people shoot for? It's a great question, actually. I'm glad you asked that because I, I had uh, made a note to mention that. Because so much of this is driven by your personal credit, because whatever business you're looking to borrow uh, for doesn't have a history, you're going to want, again, it's different by uh, institution to institution, but 650, 670, I would say, would be the floor uh, in order to be considered for any type of financing. Probably, again, you're right. Markets are going to be different, um, and uh, institutions will be different. But I would say, if you're if you're below 650, 660, it's going to be tough. Yeah, but I would. Um, and and there are lots of ways to repair your credit and improve and improve your credit. So if you think you're six, twelve months away from concept or a position where you think a bank would be willing to get involved, start now when it comes to credit. Get a cash secured credit card if you have to. Um, clean up old judgments, old medical bills, old student loans, whatever it is. But uh, get a free copy of your credit report today and go from there. Very good. Thank you. 
And Jonathan, what's the best way to go about obtaining a, um, a report on your credit? Um, you can go directly to any of the three bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, or Equifax. There are a million companies out there that are going to sell you your free credit reports, like freecreditreport.com or anything to that extent. Um, and you can certainly utilize those. Uh, you know, it'll probably cost you 20 bucks, uh, but you'll get all three bureaus in one stop, or you're allowed to get your report for free once a year. So if you wanted to go directly to all three, you'd be able to do that as well. Thanks. Thanks. Um, John, can I ask any questions before we wrap up? I think he's done a good job of answering my questions this far, and I, can't, I don't have anything else off the top of my head. Okay, great. Well, thanks to you and Crypto for your questions. I know that you know people who are going to be utilizing this presentation after the fact, really, um, those were great questions. Um, so I don't see any other questions out there online. Um, you know, before I close, I'd like to thank Jonathan. Um, he, he's a good friend of mine, um, well-respected professional within the industry locally, and I'm sure within M&T Bank up and down. Um, so, Jonathan, do you have anything in closing that you'd like to say before we wrap things up? Uh, no, I think, um, you know, my contact information was at the beginning of this presentation, uh, email and cell phone. Uh, either would be, you know, perfectly appropriate with additional follow-up questions and, uh, you know, I respect everybody that has gone through this program, and thank you for your service. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. He's been a great asset to the Institute for Veterans and Military Families. Uh, you know, he, he jumped at the opportunity to present on VetNet. He's offered to be a mentor for our EBV program. Um, so we can't thank you enough here. Um, to access all additional information on the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, you can visit vets.syr.edu. Um, and you can find out information not only on our educational programs, but kind of some of the other pillars of focus that we have here, whether it be employment, research, um, any of them. And like I mentioned, please uh, keep your eye open for our resource library, which we'll be launching in the next couple weeks here. That really aims to kind of identify 10 or 12 core areas um, that you may have questions in and you'll be able to access documents, links, presentations, all on that, all in an effort to help you get your business off the ground, turn your idea into a reality or you know grow an existing business. So with that being said, I'd like to thank all of you who joined us live and all of you who joined us out on YouTube um, and please feel free to join us on a future VetNet presentation. Thanks guys, have a good day. Thanks Mike, thanks thank Jonathan. You. Thanks, you Mike. Too.